Today is day 279 of the October 7th war and the hostage crisis. Nine months after the October 7th massacre, Hamas is still fighting out of civilian buildings and areas. It started this war and it chose to turn schools and hospitals into the battlefield. Hamas doesn't see Palestinian civilians as human shields. It sees them as human sacrifices. Hamas wants civilians to get killed, so it hides behind them. Israel wants civilians to live, so it's organizing evacuations for their own safety, even though their own government wants them dead. That's the story. That's why Israel is urging all residents of Gaza City to evacuate south for their own safety. Israel is dropping leaflets urging people to leave what will be a dangerous combat zone via designated safe routes. By the way, have you noticed it's odd that Israel is the side organizing and facilitating evacuations of Palestinian civilians? Their own government isn't doing it. That's Hamas. Everyone takes for granted that Hamas will do everything it can to keep civilians in danger. We need to call that out. Israel is going above and beyond what international law expects in keeping civilians safe. There's a principle in international law called precaution. When possible, warn of upcoming military activity. And that's what Israel is doing. You're going to hear UN officials condemning Israel for the evacuation orders, even calling them forced displacement. Now notice what they're trying to do. They're trying to criminalize evacuations, to criminalize getting civilians out of harm's way. And they're trying to keep Palestinian civilians as cannon fodder for Hamas while Israel tries to save them. It's sick and they need to be called out for it. UN officials are turning a blind eye to terrorists fighting out of their own buildings. And that means UN bodies are supporting Hamas's strategy. Just this week, the IDF conducted a counter-terror operation against Hamas and Islamic Jihad terrorists fighting out of the UNRWA headquarters in Gaza City, a UN building. They're all in on it. And we simply can't accept the fact that the UN is aiding and abetting a terrorist army that wants to murder Jews and Israelis and destroy a UN member state. Hamas is responsible for every single death in this awful war since it invaded Israel on October 7th. But if UN officials get in the way of an evacuation of civilians from a dangerous combat zone, they will also have blood on their hands. The UN has finally admitted aid trucks are getting into Gaza, but Gazans are smashing them up. For months, the UN has been blaming Israel for aid shortages. Israel is letting in unlimited amounts of aid by air, land and sea, but the UN is doing a bad job distributing it. And the aid is getting hijacked by Hamas and criminal gangs. Israel is flooding Gaza with so much aid, the UN is drowning under it. And the UN is blaming Israel to cover up the fact that it's covering up for Hamas. By now we all know, the UN can't count. It didn't count all the trucks going in from other agencies or private contractors. It didn't count the new crossings Israel opened. And it isn't counting the aid that is sitting there waiting for the UN to collect it, rotting out in the sun. In fact, the UN has undercounted the aid trucks going into Gaza by about 8,000. Here's what UN spokesman Stefan Judaric said just yesterday. Palestinian men with sticks are waiting for trucks to leave the Kerem Shalom crossing into Gaza, end quote. The aid is getting in, but Gazans are smashing up the trucks. He said all the trucks are badly damaged with broken windshields, mirrors and hoods. That's after Israel let it into Gaza. This is happening because Israel is targeting Hamas. And until now, the UN has relied on Hamas for police protection of aid. Yes, yes, the UN outsourced private security to a terrorist army that was hijacking and hoarding aid away from civilians in need. Don't take my word for it. The New York Times reported just yesterday something that we flagged up here at the citizen spokesperson's office before. Organized crowds are looting aid trucks to steal cigarettes smuggled inside. And they're looting UN trucks because boxes with the UN logo are being used to smuggle cigarettes, according to UN officials. The same officials say that these coordinated attacks by Gazans are a major obstacle to aid distribution. Once the aid is in Gaza, there's so much food entering Gaza that UN officials are reporting bags of flour being thrown by the side of the street. Not exactly something you would expect to see if there were genuine starvation, right? Right now, the contents of over 1,000 aid trucks have been stuck for weeks inside Gaza 
on the Gazan side of Kerem Shalom. Israel has taken major steps to help the UN distribute aid. The UN needs to scale up its operations, call out the gangs looting the aid trucks, and stop blaming Israel. We'll now take your questions. A reminder, you can always submit questions in advance on all our social media platforms. Our first... Our first... Our first question comes from Levi Golding. Is the war with Lebanon going to happen? And if so, when? Is the war with Lebanon going to happen? And if so, when? There is already a war with Lebanon. Because on October 8th, Hezbollah, Iran's proxy army in Lebanon, declared war on Israel. Since October 8th, it has fired 6,000 rockets and suicide drones at Israel. What do you call that? if it's not a war. Since October 8th, it's forced 60,000 Israelis to flee their homes and they can't go back because their homes are being destroyed. What do you call that if it's not a war? Since October 8th, everywhere north of Haifa has been under constant rocket sirens and a load of incoming UAVs. What do you call that if it's not a war? And since October 8th, Israel has been taking action inside Lebanon, including airstrikes, to degrade Hezbollah's capabilities and kill something like half of its commanders in southern Lebanon. What do you call that if it's not a war? Israel is already at war with Iran's proxy army in Lebanon. Just like it's at war with Hamas, there's a war in the north as well. The only difference is, in the north, that war is being fought within certain informal rules of the game. An informal understanding that Hezbollah won't strike past a certain point south, and Israel won't take the, mo the, the, the most action that it can take. But it's not a low-grade war, it's a full-scale war. The question is whether that is going to escalate into an all-out war. Whether we're going to see an all-out war in which Hezbollah shoots rockets not only at Kibbutzim in the north and the towns of Metula and Kiryat Shmona, but rockets at Tel Aviv. Whether it decides to try to overwhelm the Iron Dome system by firing 5,000 rockets a day, including precision-guided missiles. And they have a lot. Hezbollah has 200,000 rockets, over 200,000 rockets. Now, Israel is trying to avoid that. It's warning Hezbollah, back off or we will have to push you away. It's giving time to diplomatic efforts being led by the United States and the special envoy Amos Hogstein to try to push Hezbollah away from the northern border as international law requires it to do. But at some point, if Hezbollah does not get pushed away, Israel is going to have to take action. And that's because we cannot allow northern Israel to become like southern Israel where they can keep firing rockets whenever they want, and we definitely can't take the risk of another October 7th style event on a much larger scale of civilians going to sleep and waking up inside Lebanon in their pajamas or being burned alive uh, in their homes. Um, I would say that as the war in Gaza winds down, or at least the high intensity phase winds down, and we transition towards more of an insurgency, that's going to happen in the coming weeks as the Rafah operation winds down, the prospect of an all-out war in the north will increase. But things will depend, of course, what happens with these ceasefire talks in Gaza. We are waiting for Hamas's answer right now on a proposal. There are negotiations taking place. And the hope is that Hamas will agree to a proposal to release a certain number of hostages in exchange for a pause, leading to negotiations for a permanent end of the fighting and a release of all the hostages. Let's see what happens with that. If those talks fall through, the risk of an all-out war in the north increases. But if there's one thing from that very long answer I want people to remember, it's not a question of when war will erupt in the north. It's already happening. The only question is when war will escalate in the north. And you have to put people in their place and remind them about Hezbollah's aggression since October 8th, so that if, God forbid, an all-out war breaks out, people don't think it came out of nowhere. This has been going on for nine months already. Our next question is a follow-up on the topic of the war with Hezbollah. How come the two Israelis who were unfortunately killed yesterday by Hezbollah weren't saved by the Iron Dome? Uh, you're right. Day before yesterday, two Israelis driving in a car in the Golan Heights were killed by a direct strike on their car. Unfortunately, the Iron Dome system is not 100% airtight. 
it's not hermetic. It has a 95% uh, effectiveness rate, and it becomes more effective the further away the rockets are being launched. When you're talking about rockets at a very short range, then uh, sometimes they can get through. There is no perfect guarantee that the rockets won't get through. Uh, and that shows you that Israel cannot rely on the Iron Dome system and say, oh, well, neighboring territory is controlled by a terrorist army. That's all right. They can shoot rockets at us whenever we want. Um, it will be an inconvenience if there's a rocket siren, but we're safe. No, it doesn't work like that because it doesn't give absolute protection. And that's a reminder of why the war with Hamas in Gaza must end with the total destruction of Hamas's military and governing capabilities so they can never terrorize Israelis again. We cannot go back to a reality where a terrorist army in control of neighboring territory can fire rockets at Israel whenever it wants. No country in the world would put up with that. Only Israel has. And Israel is committed that this time it ends. No more attacks from Hamas, not in the north, and no attacks from Hezbollah, uh, in, no attacks from Hamas on the south, and, and nothing from Hezbollah in the north either. Our next question comes from Michelle. How do we change the narrative online? The disinformation war is so difficult, and the algorithms are so strong and hard to fight. What do you recommend? What do you see as the future going forward? The social media battle uh, may be impossible to win, and that's because it is a numbers game. Uh, there are simply far fewer of us than there are of them, and the algorithms promote things that are already popular, and they also sometimes deliberately suppress pro-Israel content. We're getting absolutely slaughtered online, especially on platforms like TikTok. But it's important to remember that the real world isn't social media. There is a real world out there too. And it's not enough to simply hit send or share for a story on your phone and send it to your 300 pro-Israeli pro or Jewish friends. You need to take the information and go outside into the real world. And that's the point of the citizen spokesperson's office that we're doing here. We're not putting on these briefings so that you have a nice shiny reel that you can hit send uh, or share on Instagram and say, that's it, I've done my part. We're trying to arm you with the information and the arguments and the talking points and the sound bites that you need to go out of social media, out of your screens, into the real world and have these difficult conversations with your friends, with your family, with your colleagues, uh, in media, if you can, outside in the real world. So you have to be there on the pitch. You have to keep fighting on social media. But don't think that's a substitute for having the real difficult conversations outside. And we are here to try to empower you to do exactly that. Okay, that's all we have time for today. We'll be back on uh, Sunday, 3 o'clock Israel time, 8 a.m. Eastern, same time every day with our team of citizen spokespeople. Uh, as always, please, if you haven't hit subscribe, follow on all social media platforms and send to just one more friend. You did it yesterday. Do it again today. One more friend who will find these briefings useful to keep fighting the good fight for Israel and the Jewish people. Thank you very much. Shabbat Shalom.